Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Gary Hibbard, who is the Professor of Communicating Cyber for Cyberfort. Uh, he comes to us with 30 years of cybersecurity experience uh, and formerly the head of business continuity and information security at various companies. So Gary's got a lot of experience to contribute to this conversation. Uh, welcome, Gary. Thank you very much for having me. I hope you're well. And you as well. Uh, so today, the topic that we've chosen to talk about um, is an interesting one to me. In information security, cybersecurity, we, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, technical resilience, technical controls. We tend to be a very technology-focused uh, you know, sort of industry group as a whole. But we're going to talk a little bit about organizational resilience, which is is a topic that I think is is underrepresented in, in cybersecurity. So, Gary, I know this is a topic you're interested in. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have you here. But let's just start with uh, what is organization, organizational resilience? What are we talking about when we say that? Okay. Um, well, to give it its official uh, sort of description, organizational resilience is the ability of an organization to anticipate, uh, prepare for, respond and adapt to everything from minor day, uh, everyday events uh, to sudden uh, shocks, acute shocks or chronic um, uh, changes uh, in the environment or indeed incremental changes. So it's that anticipating that preparation and response, uh, but also the, the ability to adapt or be adaptive. That makes sense. You know, I think that's a, a good high level definition. But when we look at cybersecurity and the the sort of, you know, technology we focus that we have, what is it that, that we're missing um, sort of as a group uh, that belongs in that category of organizational resilience? So what do you what do you see when you talk to people, uh, you know, about this topic that they, they're they're missing in that conversation? I think it's. Um... It's a it's a very simple thing actually, and when I speak to people about this, it becomes very very obvious very quickly. The thing that we're missing is the collaborative approach to uh, ensuring a, an organisation is able to uh, anticipate, which is usually risk management, uh, prepare, uh, which is usually the business continuity side of things and the response side of it. Um, but it's that adaptive side of things that I think we, we miss. But the ability to uh, remove silos, I think, is the key thing that organizations seem to miss. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we still operate quite often within cybersecurity in a tech focused world. And we keep within that, if you like, our swim lane without deviating. And I think that's the thing for me is we're missing the we're missing a trick we're missing the opportunity to work with um uh, with other areas of the business and that will make us more resilient to the the ever changing landscape in which we live is that a silo is that silo problem unique to cybersecurity or or does it exist across the organization across the organization i think yeah and the reason i ask that is because if this were the case where uh, you know, other groups in the organization are are practicing organizational resilience, if you will, but cybersecurity isn't, then that would be a different scenario versus it's a problem across the board. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think so. I, I, for me, uh, when I speak to business continuity people, it's happening less now. Um, I, I think that, you know, we are starting to see a change and, and more and more people are talking about true organizational resilience uh, but we are still in a world where i talk to business continuity practitioners and they are almost fearful of cyber security and they don't want to talk to the cyber security team and equally when i talk to cyber security practitioners 
they are fearful of talking to risk management or to the compliance team um, because the cybersecurity team are there to implement technical security controls, etc. And historically, perhaps they've uh, run, you know, run into problems when they have worked with compliance who have said you can't do X, Y, and Z. So people still are operating in silos, and it's but it's not just from the cybersecurity team; it is from other areas of the business as well. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Uh, you know, it makes me think about um, sometimes and at different times in the past, there's been a lot of conversation about how, uh, you know, cybersecurity can do a better job of connecting to the business, how CISOs need to understand and be able to communicate about the business. But it seems like this this connection to business continuity is still a, you know, a tenuous one at best. Um, it's still a challenge for cybersecurity to really put itself in the position of of understanding that the the job is not to make everything secure but to allow the business to run effectively in an environment where there are very real threats yeah i absolutely agree i mean the metaphor i always use is that uh and i mean no disrespect to anyone around this but the cybersecurity team are a little bit like the engineers uh, who um design cars or create you know beautiful machines to go out of the factories and such but um they are very concerned about the vehicle um whereas they're not as uh concerned or haven't been as concerned about what happens once that vehicle is out on the road and the people who are driving that vehicle how are they driving responsibly and i think that's the part that we need to be more engaging with is understanding that we have a responsibility beyond the um uh, the the creation uh, the creation of that vehicle and um, the business needs to understand that and I think it does appreciate that it, it can't do the business without having a safe vehicle but sometimes it isn't mindful of it. Yeah, this I, I'm always I'm always uh, um, I always jump on this term when people say the business. We used to do this inside of Tripwire an awful lot as well uh, inside of the you know um, development organization R and D where they would say, you know, things like the business has this requirement or the business needs. And I, I found that it's it's always helpful to try and break that down to who are those people? Because it's not the business, there are specific people behind that. And that helps identify where the the silos exist. Because if you if you if you use a term that aggregates people, you aren't talking about the actual people. And if you force yourself to define who those people are, you then have to sort of understand and, and deal with the silos that exist. And I wonder if if cybersecurity has a, a similar challenge and, and other groups, right? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, yeah I, com- I completely agree. I think um, you know we use that that term, the business, as you say, just to describe the um, the whole group. But you're, you're yeah. completely correct, and I think it, it's interesting that you made that point that um, the business is made up of functions, and those functions are made up of people. And I think for me, when I'm teaching and training consultants to go out to the business and uh, CISOs to go out and engage with the business is to do it on a very human level. So to go in uh, to an organization and, and say to them, right, we're going to make you more secure just isn't really helpful or tell me what your objectives are or your goals. What you need to do is understand the individual drivers for finance as compared to HR, as compared to the marketing team, as compared to the um, uh, the production team and the facilities team, etc., and then within those functions, understanding what their individual drivers are. So the the who is the head of HR? What are their motivators? His or hers personal drives and goals. If you can start to get down to that level, you can then start to be able to really influence a change, and you and remove, remove you reduce those silos. Yeah, it's so it's so easy to describe that, but it really is. It's a skill set to be able to 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 do that kind of activity, undertake that kind of activity inside of an organization. Understand who the people are, how they're motivated. Uh, that is a a, a specific skill set that I I think, especially in cybersecurity and in, in more technical disciplines, we certainly don't you know uh, recruit for and hire that kind of a skill set. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, Tom Peters, who's uh, an expert in uh, excellence, uh, wrote a, a book and he 
made a statement within it which really resonates and I think it, it, it fits very well for this, which is he was talking about skills and he talked about the hard and soft skills and it, his statement was along the lines of uh, hard is soft and soft is hard, meaning that hard skills like knowing about uh, firewalls, understanding data, uh, understanding patch management, that kind of skills, business impact mm. analysis from a BC point of view, those skills are actually quite easy. They're hard skills, but they're quite soft, you know, in terms of they're quite easy to, to do. Whereas the soft skills, the people skills, are the ones that are a little harder to um, to measure and to be able to um, engender in people. But they're mm. the kind of skills that I think are really important for us. It is possible. I think what it does take is time. I think that's the key thing is it takes time to be able to get down to that level rather than just think, right, I'll just create a spreadsheet and send it out and these are the objectives and this is what we're going to do. It's going to, it takes relationship building. It takes time to break down barriers and misapprehensions and past experiences. And a lot, a lot of that time spent, if you're someone who's more of a, a a technically minded person who's used to, you know, implementing tools, that time spent on building relationships often seems like it's a it's a waste because you're not accomplishing anything tangible. But in fact, it's it's critical to breaking down silos and, you know, accomplishing this kind of, of you know, the foundational relationships that are necessary to, to build organizational resilience. Yeah, I agree. And, but and again, I, the analogy of the car, you know, that, that metaphor comes back to the fore for me which is you know when we just focus on the vehicle um you know if you are all about the tools then what you're going to do is you're going to come up with better crumple zones on the vehicle you're going to come up with better seat belts you know stronger seat belts that can take an impact you're going to focus on all those things but you know you're going to be in for an, you've got to have an accident before you actually know that these things work Whereas if you focus on the people and you train people and you get people to understand the importance of security, then hopefully these tools um, aren't going to be necessary, these, you know, these mechanisms. And I, even from a business continuity point of view, I used to say to people many years ago, I'm writing documents that I hope will never, ever be used. That's the whole purpose of business continuity. But... Uh, in the last 10 years, I would suggest, you know, business continuity plans, if they are written uh, and structured well enough, they should be able to use to be able to prepare people uh, and organizations and individuals uh, to be able to be more adaptive to this changing environment in which we live. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. It's interesting to think about how the the rise of ransomware um, impacts that relationship between business continuity and, and information security. Because, uh, you know, ransomware is an, is an interesting phenomenon in the, in the cybersecurity space. It's a kind of attack that can only really be successful for the attacker if it gets discovered. Um, it has to announce itself in order to ask for ransom in order for that attacker to get paid. Unlike attacks that are focused on stealing data or, um, you know, other types of, of uh, information, uh, you know, they, they intend to stay stealthy. They, they don't want to be discovered. And because ransomware has to be discovered, it drives a very different type of response. And because it cripples systems, it, it has to bring business continuity and information security closer together. Have you have you seen that trend? Is that something that you've experienced or that you think is, is happening? Or am I am I off track on that? No, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, we we are starting to see. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going I'm looking at this from a through a lens of about four or five years here. I think over the mm -hmm. last four or five years, we've got better at this. I am seeing more business continuity 
practitioners coming to cybersecurity events and such to learn about um, the different uh, threats uh, threats that are out there and uh, attack vectors, etc. I think they are looking at these things uh, much more closely than they previously did because they understand that incident response is going to need the uh, IT team and cybersecurity teams are going to need business continuity because they need the incident response. So they are working much more closely together, but it's a bit of a surprise, to be honest, that it is only just starting to happen. You know, it's relatively new, four or five years in my experience, um, when you consider that uh, information security has had confidentiality, integrity and availability, meaning business continuity, for time immemorial, you know, since the very beginning, really. Uh, but it is absolutely the the yeah it, the, the gaps are starting to close. I think between business continuity and cyber security. But that that availability aspect of the CIA triad has always it's always uh, I should say always <laughs> in my experience it, it it's been treated as sort of the the third in priority in a lot of ways. There's there's maybe a focus on uh on avoiding availability incidents, avoiding outages, but there isn't or hasn't been a huge focus, not as significant on confidentiality and integrity uh, in bringing things back up to a trusted state, to a running state after an incident occurs. So it, it, I don't know how to explain that other than than the siloed behavior that, that you, we've already described, but I, I think it's definitely been a third. Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting point you raise um, when you consider that it's a triangle. Usually it's depicted as a, as a triad. It's when, yeah. when most of us put these presentations together and we use CIA, we put, you know, we put it in in a triangle. So what, there is no hierarchy there. You know, it is about making sure that all three areas are are catered for. Certainly in my experience, that's that's kind of what I've tried to do. But I think it's an interesting one in as much as I think you're right that availability has been very much, oh, well, that's the responsibility of the business continuity person that's their role confidentiality i can do with the, i can deal with that because i'm in cyber security so i can keep information secret confidential and i can uh, ensure that we have processes in place to ensure or technologies in place to ensure that it can be trusted i.e its integrity is intact but when it comes down to availability it usually comes down to, oh, well, we've got resilience in our networks and our systems and um, we've got redundancy in there. So mm -hmm. we don't, when it comes to that part of it, that's that's done and dusted. So it's kind of seen as a as an easy and quick, a quick win, I suppose. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess you, you're right. It is seen as a almost as an easy part of the triad. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, uh, so let's let's shift a little bit from you know what the problems are and talk a little bit about uh, about how companies have have changed or should change. You know there there's of course a um, you know a worldwide uh, event in the the COVID pandemic that that we can't ignore. It's changed in the last year the way that people work um, in a lot of uh, organizations um, you know around the world. And while I, I hesitate to say that we're in a post-COVID world, because I, I don't think we are, you know, for a, a many, many places, we're at least, I think, headed in the right direction at this point. Um, and it's a good time for us to start thinking about, you know, how how has that changed the, the perspective or the capabilities of organizations around being resilient? Have we become more resilient, uh, you know, through dealing with COVID or less resilient? What's your perspective on that? Oh wow. Um okay, it's uh I think there there's an element where there's a almost and certain, certainly in some of the organizations I'm uh, in touch with there is an element of um a feeling that they are untouchable now. You know, this is the worst that the business uh, that any organization the world has ever seen and we're unlikely to go through anything like it again and therefore um, you know, we are now capable of of dealing with anything. Mm. And um, that false sense of security, I think, could leave us at risk. Mm. So I think one of the things that one uh, the organizations uh, need to do on a very micro level and a macro level is just recognize that 
that it has changed the way that business is functioning. And again, back to that organizational resilience side of it, you know, being able to be adaptive, I think is going to be core to future business survival. And I think, um, you know, are we more resilient now than we were 18 months ago? I think it's just that it, the landscape has shifted and it's a, this has been a very human kind of crisis that we've yeah. gone through. As in, it has affected many millions of people clearly, um, you know, very sadly, but also it has affected billions of people in terms of the way that they now see the world. And when this all started, I actually said to many people that this is a, uh, a monumental issue for the world, of course, but I think it's a real challenge and also an opportunity for HR functions as well as the cybersecurity community to be able to um, see a new way of working in the future. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it's I think it's um, it has certainly shifted the sands quite considerably more to get getting organizations to see people differently. Yeah, yeah I, I think your point that it's been a, a very a very human crisis um for businesses is is a really interesting one um because we we so often think about business continuity about information security in technical terms in business terms and not so often in human terms and you know every so often there is an incident that that has that sort of human impact and obviously you know a global pandemic is at the extreme end of that that human impact but it it does you know, bring home that point that ultimately these businesses are made up of people. And so in order for that that organization, that business to be resilient, you, you have to deal with the, the human resilience as well. That's a core component. Yeah, I think you're abs absolutely right. And I think it's forced people to, uh, well, I'm going to say people, the board, the C-suite, it's forced them to start to um, reassess how they deal with their people. Uh, on a very individual level. Again, many years ago, when I was um, involved in business continuity for a large call center, this employed you know thousands of people. And I recall having a conversation with a, a senior uh, member of the board uh, in the operational director seat. And when I said, you know, so what's what's the recovery process? And their response was, well, we will get buses and we will bus people to our disaster recovery sites and the systems can be up and running within X amount of time uh, and therefore they'll be functional within X amount of time. Uh, and, and I forced them down the route of thinking about the people and I said, but these people are impacted by the same kind of disaster that we're likely to be impacted by because we were talking mm -hmm. about an environmental crisis. And, um, yeah. and I said, you know, they've got kids to drop off at school. They've got partners that they're going to be worried about. Then you've got to get them to their place of work. This is, you, are you expecting them to come to work two hours earlier because they're going to get on a bus that's going to take them two hours up the road? Then they've got to become operational. Then they've got to get back home to pick up little Stephanie or Stephen from school. Uh, and I got them to think through the crisis in a very human way and thinking about the impact on the people rather than just on the SLAs within the organization and the financial impact. And it was a real shift in their, their mindsets to start thinking that way. And I think COVID-19 has created the same um, mind shift in a lot of people where they had to start thinking about, well, what is the impact upon our, our people? You know, people are great people our teams are really great but now we sent them home and they are they are worried about their family members they've got elderly parents or um people dependents that they're looking after how does that impact upon them and i think that's the bit that has really shifted the uh, mindset uh to make it more of a human focused um crisis than than perhaps anyone's really thought about i, I would suggest that that the the companies where it has shifted the mindset uh, are the ones who post pandemic are likely to to be more successful. There are definitely companies where the mindset didn't shift, and those are the the organizations where you know post pandemic, post COVID, people are going to be looking to make a move and leave that organization because they've 
they've experienced how they're treated in that scenario. And so it it it, it drives even in cybersecurity, it drives a, a you know a dynamic job market. Um, you know, in, in sort of a post-pandemic economy. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that's the uh, the area where, uh, as you said, organizations who have thought about their people and have put their arms around their, their people in a virtual sense and have communicated well with their teams and kept them abreast of what's going on. I think they're the ones that are going to survive and thrive beyond this. Of course, there are other organizations, large organizations who will continue, but um, I think they'll start to see a, uh, a, you know, an exiting process once people start to become more certain about the future. Yeah, because exactly. a, again, we've got to recognize that uh, you know this new world in which we're we're living now, there are opportunities as well. That uh, you know we've got people who. Or organisations who historically would have hired only people into their in their local area can now say, well, do we really need to hire pen testers to come into the organisation to come to the office? Can't we hire the best skilled people from around the world? And um, they've recognised now that there's a real opportunity because other people have started to embrace technology and uh, new ways of working. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So let's let's see if we can close out here with some practical advice because I, you know this conversation has been very interesting. But I always like to to see if we can get to something that people can actually do. So what do you have in mind as as sort of the top actions, you know, two, three, four things that organizations uh, can undertake in order to improve organizational resilience, as we've talked about? Okay. I think um, we, we talked about removing silos, but how do you do that? I think um, I would urge anyone out there right now, whether you are in risk uh, compliance or governance or information security, data protection, business continuity, any of those supporting um, services, if you like, to come together and uh, create a working group, recognize that uh, you know, we are stronger together. That working group can sit down and start to look at their organization in a very humanistic way and, and do some force field analysis. Look at each of the functions, look at the people within those functions and, and ask yourself on a scale of one to 10, who are our supporters, who are our cheerleaders, and then uh, who are our detractors and um, the people who we've got to convince and to, to bring on this. And that's a paper-based desktop exercise that any organization can do and that doesn't matter if it's two people four people or, or ten create that working group and start to have a coordinated approach to um to your your organization and uh, the way that you approach that that preparation that detection of incidents and uh, and that response process so that's the first thing i would do is set up a working group the Next part of that is, again, if you're working for an organization that you are lucky enough to have a marketing function, then learn the language of your organization. Learn the language of your your finance team and the HR team and the operations and um, understand how we've communicated in those areas in the past. How have we uh, implemented initiatives and programs and sit down with your marketing team to come up with a an internal uh, PR campaign, because that's ultimately what you are doing. You are trying to sell a message. You are trying to sell a vision of the future. And um, you can only do that by understanding, again, the goals and objectives, which I'll come on to in a second. But you're trying to sell a, um, a message into an organization. So 
How do we sell anything in this world? Do we do it? Do we sit down and watch boring ads and boring films and, and read boring books and listen to boring music? No. And yet we still have boring policies and boring approaches to uh, uh, to our implementation of cybersecurity and risk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's look at this differently and uh, learn to be marketeers and sell what we're doing because what we are doing is extremely important. And coming back to this, that that final part, which is the goals and objectives, is go out there. Press the flesh, and if you can't, you know, meaning shaking hands with people, and if you can't do that, um, you know, go out and uh, you know, virtually have a coffee with someone, the the person who the who works in the finance team. Find out what their problems are. Find out what their issues are. Make time. Don't just find time, but make time to build connections and build your um, your reputation within those areas and be seen as a department or a function that is going to help solve problems, not just uh, become a problem. So there you are. That's my practical tips and advice. I think I think if you could do all of those things, I think you, you're going to build a more resilient uh, team, but also uh, help the organization to become uh, more resilient too. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Gary. And uh, thank you so much for spending the time with us. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. No, thank you for having me. And thank you to all the listeners who uh, listened to this conversation. I hope it was interesting um, for you as well. And uh, I look forward to having you join us for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.